Hey there, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and today it's a big one. We're going to be talking about the newest project from Nicki Minaj, Pink Friday 2. So I don't think it's controversial to say that Nicki Minaj can often be her own worst enemy. And it's the big reason I find discussing her simultaneously fascinating and also deeply frustrating. Because for all of her talent, all of her creativity, when she cares, she can be a very good, if not always great, rapper, a better singer than she's often given credit, and the architect of a formula for women in mainstream rap and trap that's been relentlessly copied, and yet her recorded output should be way better better, at least more consistent than it is. And understanding why that's the case is kind of complicated. She came up in an era where women had effectively been driven out of mainstream rap. 2000s misogyny, everyone! And thus she had to relentlessly play all those noxious industry games in order to find any sense of success, including a lot more pop crossovers than was probably necessary even in the club boom era. Now this led to albums that had tangible highs and very real success, but also some some astounding lows, trying to cater to way too many audiences, or when Nicki Minaj really didn't care that much to even bother to engage. Which is why I struggle to say she's made a consistently great album. Both Pink Friday and The Pink Print have very real problems. Now that's not saying she wasn't influential or didn't have a formula that worked. The problem became that by the late 2010s, a lot of women started copying and then improving on that formula en masse, and Nicki did not initially take it well, showcasing a range of pettiness, insecurity, and real desperation that was understandable, but also wasn't exactly helping her. For as much as she wanted all the respect, leaning on the lyrical prowess and laurels that she thought she earned after fighting for so very long on her own, I don't think she was aware about how shaky her foundation was, especially as the industry was pivoting away from the pop rap formula that she pioneered, or rather towards those artists who could handle handle that formula with less clout or drama in the streaming economy. And while Nicki Minaj would have further missteps here, see every collab with 6 9 or a wellspring of online drama and nonsense that just has never gotten dry, I figured that with every new single that she was pushing, we would eventually see a new album. And then before you know it, over five years had passed since Queen back in 2018, and I was increasingly sure that Nicki Minaj was at least getting this managed, or struck in a label deal with expectations that were not matching the current messy reality of the music industry, to the detriment of her own unique artistic process. I mean, for God's sake, Super Freaky Girl went to number one last year in 2022. It's still included on this album. Does nobody on her team have any grasp on the value of momentum? And if you were going to include that, why not add Do We Have a Problem with Lil Baby beyond just leaving it on that Queen Radio compilation, given that it was a much better song? And look, Nicki Minaj has never been great at structuring an album. This goes back to Pink Friday. And I get why this was set to be 70 minutes, given that we have not gotten a new album in over five years. And some of these features even seem to make a lot of sense. Drake, Lil Wayne, Future, Skillabang, even J. Cole. But her collabs with Ariana Grande are some of her best, and they actually complement each other really well. I think they have a lot of chemistry. And yet, instead of that, we're getting a Lord D's feature on a Dr. Luke produced song? Really? Now what this all meant from a distance is that while there are more songs in recent years that I like from Nicki Minaj than I expect, I could not set high expectations for this album. I wanted to. Nicki Minaj is an artist that I've really wanted to like a lot more over the past decade, and she normally gives me at least a couple songs every album cycle that work, and being a bit more charitable to her, it's probably the only reason the barbs don't hate my guts more than average. But alright, enough wasting time. How is Pink Friday 2? Ugh. So do you ever get the feeling that you might be trying too hard to like something, and that it should not be this hard at this point? Because after increasingly more listens this past weekend, that was my experience with Pink Friday 2, an album that might feel more current to its era than Queen did in 2018, but for many of the worst reasons that made mainstream rap this year such an utter headache. So I guess I gotta give her some credit for capturing the zeitgeist, even if catching the tail end of it has me suspecting the label 
is pushing this as far into a late release window to both get out of the way of any possible competition, but also so it could be neatly ignored by the critics and the awards alike. And while following Queen, I can say that Nicki Minaj albums have gotten a little bit more consistent. They also feel a little less special and not remotely capable of paying off five years worth of hype. In other words, I don't think this is that good, but there are some interesting reasons why. And sadly, once again, we have to start with the structure. Where, look, I understand the logic of releasing 70 minutes of music. Nicki has not dropped an album in years. She wants it to feel like a big event, especially titled as a sequel to her debut with several big features. But that works best if you think she's building up to something like a theme or she's amping up the production to present something more impressive or unique. I mean, I got a lot of issues with the bloat and an uneven pacing of Queen, but there was a loose arc and progression reasserting her presence at the very top in the face of real competition. What it means is that there should be something of a sonic or thematic core. You want the event of the album to feel special for an A-lister, not just like an assortment of fragmented songs that could have been shoveled out at any time to play the radio or streaming game. A bloated track list borrowing from Drake's stream trolling, but enough pop rap concessions that the radio crossover game is built in. Now this is where the egregious sampling rears its ugly head, where you can tell that Nicki Minaj is playing towards the exact same formula that has worked with Anaconda and Super Freaky Girl in the past, with the biggest difference coming between her and someone like Koi LeRae is that Nicki actually has the budget for the big names and the bigger samples. Hence why you get Pink Friday Girls, which was sampling Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Sidney Lauper, or My Life sampling Heart of Glass by Blondie, or the aforementioned Super Freaky Girl, or, you know, how everybody with Lil Uzi Vert samples Move Your Feet by Junior Senior. Now, I'll freely admit, I'm not super familiar with the original song. Apparently, it was a more regional, worldwide hit in the early 2000s than what I was listening to. I honestly just was not that familiar with it, so I don't have the full context for the big negative uproar around that track. Only that Nicki Minaj and Lil Uzi Vert have never really complimented each other that well, and the sheer laziness of Uzi recycling so much of Just Wanna Rock highlights just how much they didn't care about this beyond the name recognition. It's a real low point on the album. But that highlights something you will notice about this very quickly. About two-thirds of this album relies on either a very obvious sample or a very big name guest star in order to grab your attention. And it highlights the same massive problem that Queen had and that you can tell that a lot of these songs are built to stir up buzz rather than highlight Nicki's performance or wordplay or content function more as songs you could revisit beyond the controversy. And if you continuously claim that you're one of the best rappers in the world, you shouldn't have to do this. You shouldn't be playing the same game as Koi LeRae. And quite frankly, she shouldn't be playing it either. And look, I'm not against using big recognizable samples if you do something different with them or attempt to recontextualize them, make them kind of interesting. And that leads to my first big contentious take. I actually don't hate the flip of When the Party's Over by Billie Eilish on Are You Gone Already? Even if the sample is probably overused across the entire song, and it is a terrible choice for the opener because it establishes no momentum and that the sampling will be gratuitous on the rest of the album. But getting Phineas to come back and produce it actually gives Nicki a really great vocal mix for a really emotionally charged song about the hit and run death of her father and how her infant son will never know him but probably will wind up knowing way too much about his mother and how despite so much of her success she's not happy. So it's incredibly frustrating when the most follow through from that opener all that emotional context for this album, it's the big samples. Because in the very next track, we get a very liberal sample of the Notorious B.I.G. and Bogan Thugs and Harmony's 1997 song Notorious Thugs for Barbie Dangerous. Where again, she at least sounds more hungry, I like the song more than most, but it also isn't so dominant or impressive that I ignore the sample. And by FTHC with the very obvious Waka Flocka Flame sample, where she's once again launching subs at other women in rap, you realize that Nicki Minaj is very firmly in this comfort zone of what you've heard so many times before, and I'm sorry, by this point it doesn't feel special or grand or unique especially coming from her. So you run into a quandary. 
If you're borrowing from Drake's playbook of attention chasing and just giving people what they think they want, playing to the diehards, it feels like I'm getting sold something that says it's a lot more important than it is. Especially when a not insignificant number of these songs feel very abbreviated in their runtime for stream trolling and TikTok. More flexing fragments than fully composed pieces. I mean, you get murder beats for beat beat that barely crosses 90 seconds. Then of the two Boy Wonder collabs, outside of the very phoned in Drake feature on Needle. The other song, Pink Birthday, barely runs two minutes and it sounds like a chalky, runny mess of a song? I don't know. If the extravagance is supposed to come and it's spending your budget very recklessly for name producers to then barely use them, or pay Lil Wayne in future for some very weak features, or for Nicki Hendrix, it's actually a really bad future song with an atrocious mix and a Nicki Minaj guest verse. I mean, that feels like a pretty big misstep too. Who was managing this? Granted, when you also recognize that this album was recorded over the course of five years and has a lot of scrap fragments thrown together into songs that feel like glorified extras, especially in the back half. Well, once again, it fits the zeitgeist. Hell, that was basically the story behind Travis Scott's Utopia, and people apparently like that. And Nikki, she's at least a more interesting MC than Travis. Why wouldn't it work? But all of this adds bloat, especially when Nicki Minaj rapping about sex and dissing other women, especially Lotto. At least to me, it's gotten really stale, especially when she doesn't sound like she's enjoying any of it, and she's not particularly funny or witty or even creatively explicit about the sex. And while I've long had the suspicion that Nicki Minaj has a pretty conservative streak, of which she's far from alone in rap, including a lot of the men who contributed to this album, including the rappers, and where the anti-vax nonsense only touches the tip of the iceberg. You could also mention her rigid belief in unquestionable hierarchies, her traditionalism, how she frames a lot of her interactions between men and women comparably on her level, even on this album, all paired with this weird regressive bitterness. But look, I'm not about to judge this album on what it does not have, but I will say it's very revealing that after a year full of Ice Spice collabs, there are no other women who rap on this project, including Ice Spice, but an extended hook from Lord D's on the utterly inert and crappy Cowgirl, who is most infamous in 2023 for her own career being a non-starter, and because she's associated with Dr. Luke and taking a lot of shots at Kesha and her album Gag Order this year. Lord D's also shows up for throwaway backing vocals on Pink Friday Girls. Charming. But you know what? Maybe the issue at this point is my standards. Sure, this album is set up as the long-awaited sequel to Pink Friday. It's her first album in five years. It's trying to be an event. And the production is, once again, weirdly inconsistent by leaning heavily on recognizable sample and a lot of cheap-sounding trap percussion over a bloated runtime where many of these songs were known to be scrapped leftovers. But there's just enough of an idea that they might work on TikTok. But maybe that's all it needs to be. Maybe it should just be judged on that level, not any higher. I mean, it's not like that's far removed from Drake's formula these days, and he rarely sounds like he's having any fun as well. And yet, <sighs> Nicki has moments on this project that I mostly like. Beyond how Do We Have a Problem should have been on this project, as it would have been the easy highlight despite dropping nearly two years ago, and Lil Baby's hype seeming to dissipate. Now, I actually think the album is bookended really well. I already mentioned appreciating Are You Gone Already, but Just the Memory is a pretty strong melancholic closer. Looking back on the struggles that she has in her life and how her new child is centering her now in the context of those memories. I've always been fond of Red Ruby DeSlees and Last Time I Saw You. They're pretty strong singles playing to both rap and pop. And even if the sample is really obvious, I like Barbie Dangerous. Now, it might be cliche to say J. Cole has the best verse on the album, although it is way closer than it should be, but the focus on strife within the family and trying to work through it on Let Me Calm Down, it's pretty well realized. It exposes snippets of what a more serious, focused, and mature Nicki Minaj could have made, but on the flip side, we're also not really getting the kooky, manic Nicki either, and if you're framing this as a sequel to Pink Friday, defaulting to very obvious trend chasing and Instead of that, it feels like a mistake. But look, in the end, I want Nicki Minaj to have a better catalog. There's been a lot of revisionist history trying to paint her very influential back catalog and discography as being way stronger and more consistent than it was, mostly thanks to the hits. 
and because so many followed her formula to a lot of success. But being influential doesn't always mean the quality is there. Good ideas don't always translate to good execution, especially when you forget all the bad mistakes and experiments. Look at everyone who tried to rip off Eminem or Drake or Lil Wayne over the years. And look, I don't envy the position that Nicki Minaj is in, because she has to continue to play some of that mainstream pop game, be it streaming or the radio. Keeping up with changing times is very difficult, especially if the current time in mainstream rap and honestly, mainstream pop is pretty lousy. But Nikki is also at the point of her career where she could choose to shape and control more of the conversation rather than just play along. And the fact that it's trying to frame itself very loudly as being so much more, well, it plays honestly very safe. It creates this jarring, bloated experience. I don't know if Pink Friday 2 is her worst album. People tend to forget how much of an incoherent disaster Roman Reloaded is. But at least to me, it's her least essential. And as someone who was really trying to like this, and it will highlight the moments that work, mediocre at best, it was a real disappointment least for me. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, drop some comments, I'd be extremely grateful. Hell, even share this around. I'm not a fan. I'm not afraid of the fan backlash. I'm fairly certain it might be coming, but again, I wanted to like this album a lot. I tried to go in with low expectations and sadly, this didn't even really surpass those. And I don't know, I think Nikki has talked before, especially around Queen when that dropped, how there was issues with their label and management. If that's not abundantly true now, I don't know what is. It's hard to gauge, especially given that for someone who is as much of a talent as she is with the longevity that she's had, it does not make a lot of sense that it feels like she's tracing, that she is chasing trends rather than dictating them. That feels like a huge mistake. But again, it is what it is, and I, it's a real shame that it took us five years to get a project that was recorded over the course of five years, but sounds like something she could have otherwise hammered out in six months. Yeah, I have to say it. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get projects on my schedule in the new year or just yell at me more directly on my Discord, the link to my Patreon is right over there. As always, don't feel obligated. Tough times, I understand. But as always, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, I'll see you next time.